Coming up today on A Courageous Heart. If you look at the story of Esther, that's what it's showing us because God was there all along. You, you couldn't see him visibly, you couldn't touch him, but yet his hand of provision was on her to direct her, to lead her, to guide her, to give her the courage, the strength to go before the, the king and, and the same today. A Courageous Heart with Karen Dye. Hello and welcome to A Courageous Heart. My name is Karen Dye and today it's all about Girl Talk. As you recall, if you've been tuning in regularly, about once a month we are taking a, a woman from the Bible and we are discussing her here on Girl Talk and seeing if there are some things that we can learn from her and apply to our daily lives today. A lot of times people think, oh, you know, I've read the Bible, but really those characters, they lived so long ago and life is so different now. How can that be applicable to my life today? Well, I think you'll be surprised. So far this year, we've talked about Mary, we've talked about Sarah, and today I'm pleased to tell you we're going to be discussing one of my favorite women of the Bible, and I think a lot of yours too, and that is Esther. So let me introduce you to our panel for Girl Talk today. First of all, we have my friend Gwynette Palmer with me. We have my friend Tracy Buster with me. And of course, we have Diane Chamberlain. So thank you girls so much for being here today. And I look forward to discussing Esther. Now, a lot of people understand the story of Queen Esther, but there was a lot that took place before Esther became the queen. So before we get into the story though, I want to talk to each one of you. Every time I was sharing with people about oh, we're going to be on Girl Talk and we're going to talk about Esther. All of the gals always go, oh, I just love Esther. <laughs> what is it about Esther that you think women really love or just seem to connect with? Go ahead, let's start with you. Well, taking, broadening it a little bit, I'd say a fairy tale. This is a little orphan girl raised by a cousin, uh, not really with her countrymen or anything. And to think that she'd be chosen to be a queen to wear a crown, to have the jewels. Um, you know, there were a lot of bumpy roads along the way, but it is a fairy tale, and we, we love fairy tales. We love happy endings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I love that you said she had the jewels. <laughs> it is all about the jewelry, ladies. <laughs> if she had a closet full of shoes, I think we'd have been even more in love with her. Tracy, why do you think we relate to or like Esther so much? I like her because she used her influence all along the way. Everyone that she met along the way to becoming queen, she found favor with them. And so in each little job that God had her do, she found favor with the people she was serving. And she used her influence for good. And of course, the, the crown is fun to think about. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Diane, what about you? Well, I like Esther because she was, um, I think, a woman that um, just was called by God, not really knowing that she was, but just knowing that she had a, a divine, something about her that people liked. It wasn't just um, the people that, in her countrymen, but it was just everybody that came across her just loved her. Mm -hmm. And I believe that was something that God had put within her to, to cause like a favor, God's favor upon her life to others to come. Well, and I think that is true, that God's favor did rest upon mm -hmm. her and there was something inside of her, which I would hope that as believers we carry inside of us now as well, mm -hmm. called the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm and um, that people would be drawn to that, that you know, they would want to be in our presence, mm -hmm. they would want to be around us, and um, I think that's something that obviously mm -hmm. Esther possessed. Let's give our viewers who maybe are tuning in and don't know the story of Esther. There's a whole book dedicated to Esther in the Bible. Um, it's interesting, Gwinnett, that you said uh, it's, it's like a fairy tale because there are some scholars out there that say this story never did exist. Yeah that in fact it was a fairy tale. But of course we know that's not true. We know it's the word of God, it's in his word, and so we know that it's true. But let's talk about her and her story. She was an orphan girl, and she was being raised by Mordecai, who was a relative of hers. And were they rich people? No. Was Mordecai no. rich? No. no. Did they have what back then would have said, you know, that they had power, or were they just common? They were just common 
people, right? They were they commoners. Were Her yeah. parents mm -hmm. had died, and they mm -hmm. were just surviving and living. And together. So there wasn't any special world favor so. mm -hmm. on no. Esther at all, and there was no uh, lineage or heritage that would say, okay, if, if Mordecai and Esther ask for something, we need to do it yeah. out of, no. They were just normal people mm -hmm. like you and I, trying mm -hmm. to get by each and every mm -hmm. single day. Um, she was a Jewish girl, and she was not with her people. Right. Let's talk about that. Diane, tell us a little bit, why wasn't Esther with her people? Well, uh, the majority of her people had been, um, they were in, in exile, but then the Lord had called them out of exile to go back to Judea. And so uh, a remnant, only a small remnant of those people went back. And so there was still uh, a large group of them still in the Persia area. And so she was there at that time. And so really, um, when God called them out, you know, they were to go to rebuild his temple. They was to go to rebuild Judea. And so instead, you know, she was just there with Mordecai. And I'm sure too also because of, at the time, there was a lot of wealth in Persia. There was a, probably a lot of comfortability. And so it probably been better to stay there than actually go where you had to actually work and start rebuilding, which was gonna take a lot of time and effort. Mm -hmm. So she finds herself there. Do you think maybe Esther was struggling a little bit with identity? Do you think she ever wondered, you know, um, well, who am I really? I mean, my parents aren't here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not really surrounded by my Jewish nation. You know, we're coming, we're going. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is good? And I have this relative I'm living with. Do you think Esther, um, as a young woman, ever sort of doubted who she was or was trying to figure out what it was she was to do with her life or who it was she was to be? Do you think she ever I'm had those I'm sure moments? she did, and I mm -hmm. think we all do. You know, as women, we feel like, do we fit in? Do we, are we where we're supposed to be? Are we with who we're supposed to be with? And we want God to use us, but we're not sure if we're in the right spot. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine that, I, I'm sure she had those feelings because of not being with her people and not being with her parents and her family and being a young girl. She really did have a yeah. lot to face. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'm not sure all the Persian people were real excited about the Jews that stayed there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that could have made a uh, little separation. She may not have been accepted. And um, it's, it's interesting because they didn't share that she was Jewish. And I've always wondered when the decree went out, why she didn't say, I'm Jewish, and they couldn't take her. Could they, well, no, could I, they take any beautiful they, woman? They, they could take anybody, but I believe at that time, is he told her, that Mordecai had told her to be quiet yeah. because he didn't want mm -hmm. any unfavor to come toward her. Mm -hmm. He didn't want them to exclude <clears throat> her because she was Jewish. He didn't know that they would, but he didn't want to take that risk that they would exclude her from anything, um, I, I believe, in that that the king was looking at. And call and, attention to right, it. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, yeah. And because we know there were feelings about the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, that all had to play into her thinking. Mm -hmm. So there was obviously <clears throat> some wisdom, though, yes. godly yes. wisdom that was being sent through mm -hmm. Mordecai right. and protecting her for this purpose which not had yet mm -hmm. been unveiled to her, right. obviously. And I don't think Mordecai really knew initially mm -hmm. yeah. what was going mm -hmm. to happen. So you've got that scenario going on with her and with Mordecai. What's going on in the palace? we got a <laughs> king and a queen. Now, you know, you would think you're the queen, you have a king for a husband, you have everything you need, you have servants at your beck and call. You know, you want for nothing. But what's going on in the palace? Well, they're starting with a season of displaying their wealth, which is always a shaky start. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> so true. They're letting all the townspeople come through and see all that they have and all their riches and enjoy that. <laughs> so that would be the start. And then the banquet time begins. And? It was party time. <laughs> that's right. I mean, th there's no other way to describe it. And I think it says in the scriptures that uh, in he was encouraging them to drink more and have more fun. And they were, I would say, out of control. That's probably, mm -hmm. probably out of control. Mm -hmm. Definitely out of control. Were the king and queen getting <laughs> along? <laughs> they were getting along up to that point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he became very inebriated. And um, at the time, you know, he didn't take sound wisdom. <laughs> but he was that kind of man. If you look at his history, mm -hmm. he did some very um, shady things. You know, he, you could be loyal to him at one minute, and the next minute he has your son beheaded. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you look at his life, he, what, he didn't use a lot of wisdom. He didn't really think about things, and he took unwise counsel many times. Mm. So what did Queen Vashti say? She said, mm -hmm. you know what? I'm not going to do no. what you are asking me to do no. anymore. And she sort of began to buck the king, I she guess. Did. She decided, I'm not going to be 
the queen that uh, I have been. I'm not going to do everything you tell me to do. I don't know if any of you wives have ever gone through a season like that <laughs> where you've thought, okay, uh, things are changing around here and I'm going to do what I want to do. But when that happens and when we start to rebel, usually there's a consequence for that rebellion. And the consequence in this particular case was the king and his advisors get to talking and the advisors are like, you can't let her get away with this because if you let her get away with this and word gets out, all of a sudden we're going to have not only just women, but the people aren't going to respect you because your own wife doesn't respect you and obey mm -hmm. you. And women are gonna start thinking that they don't have to be right. submissive to their husbands anymore. So we gotta do something about this. And so the king decides, I'm gonna find me a new queen. And the search is on. Who wants to pick up the story from there? Well, <laughs> okay. yeah, I, I, guess I think it was interesting because I guess I, I let my mind wander to a beauty pageant and all the gals that were going into it. And here we have all these young girls mm -hmm. that are thinking, wow, a crown. I could marry a qu king. I could have all this vastness. So all these women that are be or young girls that are so beautiful go into the harem to be prepared. A whole year? Mm -hmm. A whole mm -hmm. year. They did it with diet, with beauty aids, with everything. Mm -hmm to make him beautiful. And I, I can just hear him, you know, well, I want more of this because then I'll look better than her. Mm -hmm. And don't you think there was competition with those girls? Oh, surely there oh, was. Oh, it, it had yeah. to be a crazy it, time definitely. in the harem. And then yeah. something, something <laughs> yeah. through that pageant and through all those treatments made Esther stand out. Even though they were all being made beautiful, something about her was still naturally beautiful from inside that made her stand out to the right. people that were mm -hmm. helping them. And I would just love to have seen her, what that was. There's a certain sort of, I, I use the term glow for lack of anything else, but when you are walking with God and when you love mm -hmm. the Lord with all of your heart, there is a certain glow that comes mm -hmm. from within, mm -hmm. male, True. female, whatever, but you are attracted to it. And I think you're right on, Tracy, that that's exactly right. That's what was going on with Esther. Esther was there for a far more bigger purpose, though, wasn't mm -hmm. she, than just competing for the king's affection? Why was she there? She, she was there to... Um, protect her people. She was there because uh, eventually when Haman came into the scene, he was wanting to destroy the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And so that was God's chosen people. And so she was there to intercede for them. She was there on their behalf, not knowing it and not thinking about it at the time, but God had really um, providentially put her there and placed her there for such a time for the people. Mm -hmm. What do you think she said to Mordecai when Mordecai said, Esther, <laughs> here's what I want you to do. If you don't go in there and plead on our behalf, your whole nation is going to be wiped out. So I need you to go in there and you need to plead on our behalf with this king, mm -hmm. this semi-crazy yeah. king, who mm -hmm. you don't know from one day mm -hmm. to the next mm -hmm. how that mood's mm -hmm. gonna swing. Do you think she went, okay, <coughs> I'm ready, I've had a year of beauty treatments, I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna give him what for? Is that how the story goes? I don't think so because she knew what the rule was. You do not go to the king, no matter who you are, mm -hmm. without being asked. Mm -hmm. If you, um, and one story, a thing I read about it said that the, he had someone there with a sword. Right. And no you could be beheaded if you went into the king's court without being asked. It just was not done. And um, beauty and all of that aside, uh, that's a big step to take. You know, and she sent back a message to Mordecai and said, do you realize that um, <laughs> unless he asked me to come and he hasn't asked me in for 30 days, mm -hmm. that maybe uh, this might not be a good idea. Yeah, how many <laughs> times have we said that yeah. when God has asked us to mm -hmm. do something or sent us in somewhere and we stop and we say, have you thought this through? Yeah. <laughs> you know, can I throw up a few more things that I've come up with that maybe you haven't thought about? And of course, God being God, he's thought everything through and he doesn't ask mm -hmm. you to do it unless he's given you the ability and the provision and the favor to go mm -hmm. ahead and do it, which is exactly what Esther found. She was able to go to the king mm -hmm. and she was able to get his favor. Mm -hmm. And uh, long story short, which you can read in your Bible, and I hope you do, she was able to save her nation. And I think that is why all of us love the story. It's a story of love and obedience and um, 
you know, getting the crown and the jewels <laughs> and the palace, yeah, but I also know. knowing that um, there was a happy ending. But that's looking at it through the world's eyes. Let's look at it through some spiritual eyes and understand why there's a happy ending. Go ahead, go ahead. When I think about Esther going to the king, if we back up to a little bit, that had to be a very long walk from her room to that court. And I, I saw this parallel of it in that she had to stand there and wait for that king to recognize her. And until he took the scepter and put it out, she didn't know she was safe. When we come before our king and we stand there and he reaches out with his mercy and then we will be able to enter the court with him. And I, I just think it's a parallel. I think it's a wonderful thing to think of this wonderful Jewish woman who knew that God was in control and was going to let this, her earthly king, accept her, but knowing that God was going to show the mercy through that. I, I love that, that picture. I love that mm -hmm. picture. And it kind of spawns me into the next uh, series of questions I have for you because, yes, when we get to glory and when God reaches out his mercy to us and we are able to enter into his presence, that's going to be an amazing time. Mm -hmm. But are we able to do that today? Mm -hmm. Can we still do it here on earth? Are we able? I just got goosebumps thinking about that, mm -hmm. how even today, in our sinful nature, and certainly not having a year of beauty treatment or, <laughs> yeah. you know, soul makeovers or whatever, just day by day trying to walk the right steps and to live the right way, but just having that personal relationship with Jesus that makes us acceptable, that is like that year mm. of beauty treatment that Esther went through. It's that covering of Christ that we're still able to approach him today, our king, here mm -hmm. on this earth. We don't have to wait until heaven. And he finds favor on us enough to come and to be involved in our life because he sees our, his son Jesus Absolutely. on us. You know, sometimes we worry. I know I have friends that have said, um, I don't feel like I can ask God for things. It feels selfish or it feels, and scripture tells us that we can approach the throne of grace with confidence. Mm -hmm. When I think of Esther walking in and how much courage that took and how scared she must have been and that, that scripture assures us we can walk in with confidence and approach that throne and ask and lay our, requ our requests in front of him. It's just such a blessing. It's so humbling and he loves us that much and mm -hmm. I'm, that's exciting to me. Mm -hmm. And that's a great lesson to learn from Esther is that she did go in with a request mm -hmm. before her king mm -hmm. and God does say that we can come and ask yes. him and he is involved in every Every aspect of our life. My guess is none of us are going to be asked to sacrifice ourselves to save a nation, you know, that we know of. Right. Mm -hmm. At least right. as of today, mm -hmm. I don't think any of right. us are going to get the call that says, we need you to go into this country, Karen, or Gwinnett, or Tracy, or <laughs> Diane, and we need you to plead on the behalf of the United States. I don't think that's going to happen today. <laughs> but we are pleading on behalf of humankind to our king mm -hmm. every single day. We should be praying for mm -hmm. them and asking him for that. That's a big thing mm -hmm. that we ask for. But do you think God is even interested in the little things we would ask for? Oh, or is yeah. he just interested in the Esthers of the world that have these huge requests so that he can show off and say, yeah, I'll save you, I'll save yeah. all of you? Yeah. Or how do you think he reacts? I think it's the depiction of the church even today. Because if you look at the story of Esther, that's what it's showing us. Because God was there all along. You, you couldn't see him visibly. You couldn't touch him. But yet his hand of provision was on her to direct her, to lead her, to guide her, to give her the courage, the strength to go before the, the king. And, and the same today. Was she perfect? No. Did she do things wrong? I'm sure. But yet even in the things that we do, uh, not perfect, not always right. right. God's unseen hand of provision is always there for us, and He's, he's with us, and um, He's not going to turn against us. And so that grace and, the, and that love is just it's overwhelming to me when I think about it, because that's how loving and caring our God is, you know, for us today, to, that He's never going to leave us nor and forsake us. And I think us. that sort of reiterated itself through mm -hmm. Esther, mm -hmm. because she walked in grace, yes. mm -hmm. and she didn't just go barreling in there and Sorry. making demands. She mm -hmm. walked in love, mm -hmm. she walked in grace, mm -hmm. and she walked in awe. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, and it's important for us mm -hmm. to do the same thing with our king. In uh, chapter four of the book of Esther, uh, it talks about how she said before all of this happened and she had to go approach the king when she found out what she was being asked to do, she said, well, I'll do it. If I die, I die, but I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know if she said it with that tone or if she said it with yeah. conviction, like, if I die, I die, but I will do it. 
Um, I can think back in my own life how I know that God has asked me to do something, and I'm like, well, if I have to do it, I guess I have to do it, so I'll go do it. But at the same time, it was obedience, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. yes. Well, the favorite thing of all of Esther for me is 414, where it says, for such a time as this. Mm -hmm. Because I can look back on my life and things that have happened or situations that I've been exposed to mm -hmm. or things I've learned that I've thought, <laughs> that's of no value. Mm -hmm. And maybe five years later, maybe mm -hmm. 10 years later, for such a time as this, I learned that. And in Romans, it says, you know, in Romans 8, uh, he causes all things to work together for good according to his purpose. Mm -hmm. So each one of these things, and, and a, a lot of times uh, in a Bible study recently, one of the gals was sharing something and she said, I, I just don't know why that happened. And I said, but for such a time as this, maybe that's why. Because that is a statement each right. one of us can use that's over right. and over. God will prepare us. Maybe we won't see it for years. Maybe we'll see it an hour later. Mm -hmm. But for such a time as this, we are prepared. Sure. I think all of us have probably walked through something we would have much rather avoided. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. You know, life circumstances, mm -hmm. maybe it's a divorce, maybe it's the loss of a child, maybe it's um, a prodigal of financial issues, depression. I mean, the list goes on and on and on of things that the enemy sets up to try and, and steal us away. But if we continue to walk with Christ and mm -hmm. trust Him, knowing that He is sovereign, mm -hmm. and knowing that He allows things to work in our lives yes. to begin to mold us and to build character in us, that we can use those things later to minister to someone who perhaps is walking through that similar valley. Absolutely. And we're able to do that. So I love that for such a time as this. You know, I also like the fact that I think Esther really does have such a modern day application mm -hmm. in every aspect. Um, you know, number one, just the fact that I think God in some ways was testing her character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. he wanted to know, he already knew, but I think he wanted her to know mm -hmm. what she was made of and yes. what he was made of. Mm -hmm. And I think so many times, especially women, you know, we get uprooted. I remember when my husband told us we were moving to Missouri and I didn't want to move to Missouri. I wanted to stay in Illinois. And, and you know, you're uprooted and you're moved and you're transplanted and, and all of a sudden I'm forced to go out and do things that I didn't have to do before in the mm -hmm. comfort of my own little world. And I think sometimes that was a test of my character. And it was a test for me to say, God, are you going to be with me in this? And what happened is out of my obedience, the same way with Esther, out of her obedience, there was a blessing. Out of my obedience, there was a blessing. Mm -hmm. You know, I've gotten to do things I never would have gotten to do before. Um, we're getting close to winding up, and I want to give each one of you an opportunity to share perhaps how you think, after we've studied Esther, how you think now that would be applicable in your life today? If there's a circumstance that comes to mind right away, maybe specific, maybe in generalities, but just by taking the time and zeroing in on Esther and really looking at her under the magnifying glass, what kind of, uh, what kind of information did you take from her example? Let's start with you this time, Diane. What do you think? Well, I, I think I took from her that um, you can be courageous and have a lot of courage, even though sometimes you don't feel like you have it. Mm -hmm. um, you can do things beyond your human nature mm -hmm. because you're trusting in a greater power, which is, which is God. And I believe that time when she was walking, she trusted in God to save her. Do you think her knees were shaking? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it is possible for us yes. to be brave and mm -hmm. courageous exactly. and still be scared inside True. knowing that God's going to take care of yes. us. Yes. Tracy? What I love about Esther is that there's so many places in the book where it might have seemed like God was being silent and he wasn't paying attention maybe and we sometimes feel like that with things that go on in our lives with parenting or medical conditions or just things happening at where's God and when you step back and look at the book of Esther the big picture it's so obvious that all along the way he was there and providing things to happen to, to make it for such a time as this. But I, I wonder if on the way to the palace to be judged with all the other women, if she wondered if God was paying attention. And, mm -hmm. and But sometimes when we step back in our lives and look at our bigger picture, mm -hmm. he was there all along. And that's what helps us have faith. And how many of us have experienced that where we look back mm -hmm. and we can see his hand yes. on everything. But boy, when you're walking it, you, can't see it. you, you can't are. See it. That's where the faith comes mm -hmm. in. Right. That's where the faith comes in. I think we could sum it up by thinking uh, 
what's the saying, get out of the boat or out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. uh, we get to get comfortable, you know, doing the same thing, going to the same places. Mm -hmm. uh, we know our limitations. We know uh, kind of what they're going to talk about. And I think that's what's fun about this is we're studying these women and looking at them in a different way and we're seeing all kinds of new things. So I think when God opens a door and it's not your comfort zone and it's not exactly where you want to walk, give it a try because chances are he's got a great plan for you, you know. Uh, don't look down, that's what Peter did and fell in the water. So keep your eyes on mm -hmm. the Lord, mm -hmm. go through the door and see what he's got to offer because if not you're going to miss a real blessing. And you know it's not always that he's calling us into a palace and asking mm -hmm. him to trust him mm -hmm. as in this particular case. I mean you know, it's one thing to have God say, okay, I'm done with you in this position in life. I want you to move on to this position in life. I mean, it, that can be scary. Right. Mm -hmm. But still, that's not as, for me at least, and maybe it's different for you, but that's not as scary as saying you get a bad doctor's report and God mm -hmm. say, okay, I'm going to ask you to walk this with me for a while, mm -hmm. and I need you to trust me. But I promise I'll be with you and you have my favor with you, and it's all going to work out. And that's where we trust yes. that he's going to be with us. I also think that God had a very specific plan for Esther when she was born, years and years before she ever made her mm -hmm. way into that court. Mm -hmm. And does God have a plan for each one of us on the yes, day we are born? Mm -hmm. He does. Yes, he and does. do we get in the way sometimes? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Predetermined. And do you think Big he kind time. of shakes his head yes. and thinks, you know, I really do have this if you will just trust me. Mm -hmm. If you will just trust me. You know, we've had a great time today talking about Esther. And she really is one of the women in the Bible that we hear her name and we just smile because we like what she represented. She's courageous, she's brave, yet she's vulnerable and she's scared. She's beautiful, yet she's so innocent in so many ways. And she never used her power or her influence for negative things. She always used them for life and for things that God called her to. You know, you may be watching today and thinking, well, that's fine for Esther. She was born for such a time as this, but what about me? What's my purpose? Well, you know, I can tell you one thing right now. Your purpose is to glorify God, to be in fellowship with him through his son, Jesus Christ, and to spread the word. You can start there. And once you get into the mode of fulfilling that purpose, I think you'll find, a lot like Esther did, that God's favor is upon you, and he will trust you more and more as you begin to trust him. The preceding program was made possible by the generous support of our viewers. If you would like to become a partner with Karen Dye Ministries, please contact us through our website at www.karendye.com. If you would like a DVD copy of today's program, you may order one through our website. A Courageous Heart and Karen Dye Ministries, inspiring real people to live with real courage for Jesus, no matter what their circumstances. Courageous Heart is a viewer-supported ministry 